seven or eight years ago, I received a very, very curious phone call from my mother. And she was in a state of semi-hysteria. Now, a few days before, she'd had a very curious experience whereby she was walking onto the village I was brought up in, and there's two people in the audience who actually were brought up on the same village, so we'll know this. It's a place called Bromble Pool on the Wirral. And a few days before, she'd been walking onto the, the village, and she had noticed a very, very curious um, smoke circle in the sky. And she explained it to me, and she said it was like a kind of a, a circle of smoke that spun and then suddenly at super fast speed headed off to North Wales, really fast. She then phones me back two or three days later in this state of hysteria and I said, Mum, what's the problem? And she said, Tony, you know the way I live alone? And I said, yes. And she said, and I go to bed every night and I close my bedroom door. And she said, this morning, at the middle of the night, I woke up and I couldn't move sleep paralysis if anybody knows about sleep paralysis so she obviously was in the state of sleep paralysis but she said that she then looked towards the bedroom door and the bedroom door was open and then she described to me how she saw a s five fingers come round the door long and thin and this little creature pop its head round and look at her blink and then dodge back as if she wasn't expecting this creature wasn't expecting her to be actual thinking and being awake she said, Tony, what did I see? Now, my mother would not know a classic grey if it bit her on the bottom. She wasn't of that generation, she wasn't interested in any of these things, but she described in absolute, she said it had huge black eyes, it had two holes for a nose and a slit for a mouth. But what disturbed me was the way she said it reacted to her. It looked at her and it blinked and looked shocked. The description she gave is a very, very precise one, and a very, very curious one. 19, in 2018, uh, in a place in northern India, they actually found some cave paintings that were 10,000 years old. They were underneath two small villages in northern India. The cave paintings depict, among other things, creatures coming down from the sky, and these creatures that had huge black eyes and two holes for a nose and slit for a mouth. Roll forward to the work of uh, Graham, Graham Hancock. Has anybody read Supernatural? Okay, a fascinating book about dimethyltryptamine, which I'll touch on a little bit later and various other things. Graham Hancock describes how there are certain cave paintings in the Drakensberg Mountains in South Africa in a place called the Junction Shelter. And in the Junction Shelter, these paintings are again probably around about 15 to 20,000 years old. In these paintings, they depict exactly the same creatures. The long black eye, the black eyes, and the slit for a mouth. Not only this, but Graham Hancock points out that there is something called the, uh, the Dying Man, and a, a painting in Peche Merle in France, which again depicts exactly the same creatures. So the question here is, an elderly lady in her 90s, in Merseyside, modern times, people in ancient times seeing these things and drawing them and depicting them. But it gets more curious. There's a plant called Ain Gazelle in uh, modern day Lebanon. And there they have uh, these curious statuette statues that they discovered around about 1984 or 1985. And these statues again depict exactly the same creatures in exactly the same way. So this is some kind of a trope. This is something that goes through history and you cannot just pretend that it's a modern day phenomenon. I know people will argue and turn around and say it's the cover from Whitley Strieber's book Communion from way back in the 1970s. That was an image that surely is some form of archetype. Now this thing started to intrigue me and I started to think, what is going on here? What are these entities and what do they, what do they involve? Now, one of the members of my extended group, again, who will remain nameless, is doing research at the moment um, at Imperial College. And they're doing research where people are taking a substance called dimethyltryptamine. This is a legally sponsored exercise to actually understand what happens in the brain when people take dimethyltryptamine. Now, dimethyltryptamine is one of the most powerful hallucinogenic substances known to man. It's known as an entheogen. 
the word entheogen actually means to try to discover the God within inside yourself. And what they're doing is they're testing to <coughs> see exactly what happens when people have these extraordinary experiences, these somehow drug-facilitated out-of-body experiences or whatever we want to call them. And this associate of mine described to me that he had taken some dimethyltryptamine and immediately, and if everybody, anybody's been involved in dimethyltryptamine, they know that what happens is you kind of suddenly shoot out your body and you suddenly find yourself in another reality that's actually more real than this reality. And he finds himself in this kind of what they call the DMT cage. And he's in this cage and suddenly there's this entity and it comes towards him and it taps him through the cage and says, do not do it this way, you're doing it wrongly. You should not be doing it this way. Please don't do it this way. He then goes back, comes back into alternate realities, comes back here. Two weeks later, he does the same exercise, he takes the drug, he ends up in the same place. And the same creature appears and turns around to him and says, I told you last time, you do not do it this way, you must actually do it other ways. Now the question we have to ask here is, if this was just a part of his subconscious, this being seems to have independence of him. It seems to be part of him but independent of him. In my new book, this is what I'm going to be discussing. I'm going to be discussing the ideas that these entities seem to be part of us, but also seem to be alien to us as well. I call them egregorials. The reason I call them egregorials is that an egregore is a, a collective when a group of people come together like we are, there is something that is greater than us because we are a group. It's, it's, it's been known for years when crowds get together, there seems to be a kind of an egregore that's created among them. When my little group meets up, we always discuss ideas and thoughts and we get excited in the ideas and thoughts. And it seems to be that something greater than us has been created. Now, what is taking place here is it seems to be that people's consciousness seems to be able to create something that is greater than ourselves. Now in the book I discuss not just as people who've read my books will know this, I don't just make these statements, I back it with science. And I'm particularly intrigued of the implications of these concepts of egregorials and egregorial ideas and egregorial thoughts with what we know about quantum physics and something called the collapse of the wave function. Now in quantum physics, as you, you may or may not be aware, is that subatomic particles until they are measured or observed, do not exist. Seriously, fact. What they are is what's called a, a probability wave. What that effectively means is that it's a probability wave that a subatomic particle may be found in one location or another location. And depending upon the act of observation or the act of measurement makes the subatomic particle change from being a probability wave to being a point particle that's located in three-dimensional space. But before it is observed, or before it is measured, it's nowhere. Now, could this be what reality is? Could it be that what we do is, collectively, we all here are observing and measuring this environment around us? We create what is called consensual reality because we all agree this is what the consensual reality should look like. It's a collective thing. Could it be that under certain circumstances, other things can be created that can actually use our ability to create the world around us and actually manifest themselves in certain ways. And in this way, I'm reminded of the writings of a lady called Alexander Neal, who was a, a French-Belgian lady in the 1920s who spent a lot of time in Tibet. And when she was in Tibet, she created what she called a tulpa, which is a thought form. And what they did was they decided that they would create this um, little monk, nice rotund little monk, and that the entity then started to come into three-dimensional reality. And it used to follow them round. But then it started to get independence of them, and it started to get quite malevolent and quite nasty. And in the end, they had to work together to actually destroy this, this entity because they brought it into existence. The famous case that is very, very similar took place in Toronto in the 1980s when a group of researchers were playing with a Ouija board and they decided to test whether the, the, the communications they were getting were actually a creation of their own minds or not. And what they decided to do was to actually create a backstory that was totally fictional of a young man who was living in 17th century England. 
they gave him a name, they gave him a location and everything. This entity then started to manifest itself as if it was independent of them. So yet again we have this feeling that we can actually create in some way or other something that is outside of ourselves but seems to be independent of ourselves. So the term egregore is the term I use. I also suggest that egregores probably exist in what I call the pleroma. Now the pleroma is a Gnostic term and it is the, the reality behind this reality. The place that you can go when you're in altered states of consciousness. Now many members of, of my little group are in the audience at the moment. One of the things we discuss a lot of times are the issues of out of the body experiences lucid dreaming. And the idea that when you are in an out of the body experience or a lucid dreaming state and you encounter other entities are these entities again just figments of your imagination or do they have independence of yourself? In the book I cite many, many cases of individuals who have had experiences that suggest that these entities are independent of ourselves in some bizarre, peculiar way. So historically, what do we think about these beings? Well, in the book I do a full review of the history of these kind of entities going right back into uh, ancient history, right back to, to Sumer, to uh, ancient Mesopotamia, uh, into the Assyrian Empire and very, various other developing civilizations at that time. And these things are found all the time. They are everywhere. They're in every culture. Every culture you go to, you will find these entities. In Islamic culture, you have the jinn, and there are various types of jinn that seem to be created in different ways. Um, within the, 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 the really ancient traditions, for, for example, in terms of the um, non-canonical um, parts of the Bible, um, like the Book of Enoch. In the Book of Enoch, they talk quite specifically about a group of entities that actually came down onto Mount Hermon in present-day um, Lebanon. And these creatures came down, and they actually taught the local group how to develop things such as women wearing makeup and these kind of things. Now, if you read the Book of Job, there's some uh, Book of Enoch, there's some fascinating elements in there, some really interesting ideas that were actually have carried through to what we would consider quasi-modern um, mystical traditions. And in the book, I have a whole section on the the work of uh, Dr. John Dee and his assistant Kelly, and how they were manifesting what seem to be entities, egregorials, by using magical techniques and magical uh, processes. We then move on to there to think about the concepts of something called the Watchers, which actually the word egregorial means. It actually comes back to the term of the Watchers, and the Watchers from both Islamic tradition and from uh, Ethiopian tradition, and from various other traditions in the past. So it seems that these entities seem to have some kind of dynamism about them. Now one of the things that um, I was also going to mention today was that somebody who sadly is not here today, which is very, very sad, is a guy called Braham Murray. And Braham became a good friend of mine over my, one of my previous books on uh, the writings, of J writings and life of J.B. Priestley. Braham, in his autobiography, Anything that can go wrong will. Braham was a top, um, I think he was the youngest British director who had um, a play on Broadway in the 1960s. And he describes a day in 1969, and I'd love to believe the coincidence and the synchronicity that it was actually today, 50 years ago. Because he describes how he was wandering through London and he came across a beautiful esoteric bookshop. And he went into the bookshop and he bought one of the, the volumes by Young. And he read, he, after this, he read this book and it fascinated him so much. But what happened was, at, when he got home that night, he was phoned up by an associate of his. And the associate turned around and said, there's a guy called Arnold Herningstadt who's flying in from Oslo. Uh, and I'd like you to go to Heathrow and pick him up. Braham goes and picks the guy up, brings him back, and over the next few days they become quite friendly. And one day they're having a discussion. And Braham says, and he's talking about the essence of evil. What is evil? Is evil tangible? And this guy goes, 
it is the beast. And he said, the beast is over there. And Braham says in the book, and he told me this many, many times, he said he looked over and there was a chair. And this entity appeared in the chair in three dimensions. And it, it was almost like the Gorgon. It had sort of uh, snakes in its hair and it looked at him and then turned around and then faded and disappeared. And in the book I mention this and I say, this is intriguing. What did Braham see then? What was created in his mind? Was this an independent entity? And I'd like you to think for a second about this. You could turn around and say it was hallucination. But think about how hallucinations work. There are two hallucinations taking place here, aren't there? There's the hallucination of him seeing the creature in the chair, but there's also the hallucination of the fact of taking out information. Because if I hallucinate you there sitting in the chair, I cannot see the chair behind you. So the chair behind you has taken, been taken out of my consciousness field, as well as me seeing the hallucination. Now this is a fascinating idea, it's called a metachoric model. And Celia Green was one of the people that actually worked on this, and the idea that hallucinations are far more peculiar and powerful than we believe them to be. So the question is again, there seems to be something there that's expanded into three-dimensional space that seems to have independent existence of your consciousness. What I suggest is, is that in some way, again, and it's an area I'm thinking about for a future book, is that these entities seem to be able to create something from our fear. They seem to feed on fear. They seem to be aware if they can frighten you, it seems to generate something within themselves. So this is where I'm going with my writing at the moment. In terms of my overall philosophy on this, I genuinely, when I started writing the book, I really wanted just an explanation for my mother's experience. Now, some of you will know and will say that there is an explanation for this. It's called Charles Bonnet syndrome. Has anybody come across Charles Bonnet syndrome at all? Okay. Charles Bonnet syndrome was actually analysed by a guy called Charles Bonnet. It's always fascinating, isn't it, how these people find things that are named after themselves. It's a real synchronistic <laughs> coincidence. Charles Bonnet noticed that his grandfather, Charles Lullin, when he was in his 70s, started describing seeing these strange creatures. And he would sit there and he would see beautiful women walking through his, his living room with huge hats on. It is, recent, it is now known that it's a, it is a pre, Charles Bonnet syndrome is a precursor for Alzheimer's disease. And one of the things that happened with my mother before she saw the alien was she called on me one day, uh, I called around to see her, and she said that, um, she turned around to me and she said, the little children have stopped singing, they don't sing anymore to me. And I'm thinking, is she letting children in from the house, you know, what, what's going on here? And she said, no, no, there's children, they're little children, and they follow me round. And they laugh and they giggle, and they, 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 they're happy people. And she said, they're not quite as friendly as the old man in the kitchen. He's very, very friendly. And I'm thinking, is she letting up people into the house? But this is part of Charles Bonnet syndrome. But what intrigues me here is the little children, the size of the, the, the creatures that people see in Charles Bonnet syndrome. And it's not just to do with elderly people. People that get classic migraines sometimes see these things as well, in part of their um, pre-migraine pre aura. There are also people who experience temporal lobe epilepsy that seem to see these things. And there seems to be a link between this and shamanism. And in the book I have a whole section on shamanism, including some people I know who are practicing shamans who have explained to me exactly what is going on in these circumstances. So what we seem to have here is something quite strange and something that again goes through history. And the other area of the book I really focus in on is the little people, the fae, the fairies, the, 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 the little creatures that people have reported throughout history. What are they? They're universal. You find them in most cultures around the world. <laughs> These creatures seem to have independent existence again. They seem to have a degree of malevolence, but also a degree of support for human beings. And people, again, experience these things when they take mind-altering substances such as dimethyltryptamine. As Terence McKenna said, you know, they are the machine elves. You take DMT, you see elves. Everybody sees elves. It's what they see. But why do they see elves? I want to dig a little bit deeper. I want to know what it is. What are these archetypes and why are they there? What is it telling us neurologically about the way the human brain works? 
the archons uh, really fascinate me, uh, just for everybody who, who's not into Gnosticism. Archons, the example I always like to give is if you watch the movie The Matrix, Agent Smith is an archon. It's kind of a creation to manipulate, to keep us controlled within this environment. Did you say they're artificial intelligence then, or...? It's, it's an interesting point again, and it's one of the questions that I try to, to, to answer in the book, is if they seem to have independence of existence of ourselves, and they seem to have motivations that are different to ourselves, it suggests that they are independent of us. It suggests that they have ulterior motives. But what those motives are, I don't know. There's a, a friend of mine who's a, a, an American writer, and he has the idea, again, the thing I pointed on before, that they exist to actually create fear, and by creating fear, they actually feed off the energy that we give off as fear. And I know that in esoteric traditions, that's actually been believed for a long, long time. Would that be the same thing as a jinn or a bell? Yes. Yeah, jinns, again, I have a section on jinns. Um, because, again, they intrigue me, because they, again, seem to have come out of the kind of the, the Middle Eastern belief system within the desert, <coughs> the desert peoples. And jinn are extremely interesting, because I, I was not aware that there's different types. And there's four or five different types of black jinns and blue jinns and gin and tonics. <laughs> no, sorry, I didn't help that one. Um, but they seem to, to have this kind of power. Now, again, it's the question, do people just make these things up because it's a nice, good story? Now, I don't believe this. I don't believe that cultures and civilizations just make these things up. It's generally based upon experiential things. And I always say to people, we exist in this kind of cosseted world where we're in boxes, we're surrounded by walls and carpets and, and, and everything, and we drive around in our cars to spend a night under the stars on a summer's evening suddenly you're then in touch with the telluric forces within the, within the ground, within the world. And I'll guarantee you will see things and feel things that are not natural. In the book, I have a fascinating section where a guy wrote to me and he was doing an archaeological dig around Heathrow Airport. And while he was doing the archaeological dig, he used to wander around in the mornings early morning and he said he was wandering around early one morning and he said suddenly the air around him was electric and there were kind of things in the air all around him aerial spirits and they were flying around him now this guy's a scientist and he was explaining to me this was the most peculiar thing that had ever happened to him it was as if a window had opened to another world that abuts this one and because the conditions were right they seemed to come through now again, as he argued, he said he started to read up about these things, and apparently this area had a reputation for having these things since medieval times. But he didn't know that at the time. So again, that's to me proof that whatever he experienced was somehow there within the ground around. Now we know, you know, the memory of stones, we know that the environment that we exist within, there seems to be some kind of power force that we can sense sometimes. And I think these ele elementals are somehow part of that. Um, can I ask a question about um, sort of female icons that apparently appear, you know, either say Our Lady of Lourdes or in, uh, on that as well. Lucia Santos uh, at, uh, in Iberia or Guadalupe? I, yeah. I, I mean, uh, the, would you say these come out of the press, uh, out of the past or out of the future? I mean, what, the, 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 the whole there? concept of BVMs, as they're known, <laughs> Blessed Virgin Marys, is, is again a whole chapter in the book. And I'm quite intrigued by this, because if you start looking into what was reported, for instance, at Fatima, you will find a lot of these BVM situations, they seem to be around caves. Caves seem to be the crucial thing, and I found a, a consistent theme. There was the cave, you know, at Fatima with the three children when they actually saw the Virgin Mary, which, of course, the creatures, the, the beings themselves, never actually turn around and say that they're the Virgin Mary. They're interpreted as being the Virgin Mary, but if you actually start looking back into the history, you'll find that the cave that it happened in has a name that suggests that there was actually a female presence in that place and had been seen for general and pre-Christian times. So clearly this is something that's always been there that seems to manifest at certain times. And when it manifests, we apply our understanding of how the world works. And of course, in 18th and 19th century uh, uh, France, it's going to be interpreted as being something to do with Christianity, something to do with Catholicism, in that way. But of course, if you start reading, you'll find that, for instance, in Fatima, the amazing incidents with the, the sun spinning in the sky. 
and coming down and supposedly drying all because it had rained and everybody's clothing dried. Now obviously it wasn't the sun that was but spinning. Is it possible that, that they, I mean, say with relation to the Fatima, like, mm -hmm. which was witnessed by maybe up to 100,000? It was. I mean, could they be coming out of the future? rather than coming out of the past. That's a possibility. I mean, effectively, if you take the argument of Minkowski and block time, for instance, the idea that, that effectively is a permanent present and, and time is, as Einstein said, an illusion. We actually say the present and the future can overlap. Now, I've had my own experiences of these things where time seems to have changed. And in my book, The Labyrinth of Time, I gave an example where I was in, um, in uh, southern Turkey uh, in, in near the Menderus River and I was sitting on the top of an old deserted mosque and suddenly the air around me shivered and what had been a, a valley, the Menderus Valley, suddenly became uh, a, an, an elbow of the sea and it was full of water and one of the hills in the hillside was an island and then I swore, and I still swear to this day, I started seeing a Greek tyranny coming around the side of it and then I snapped out of it. Now what Sorry, was... A Greek Tyramy, it was one of the kind of boats with the kind of the oh, thing in the front, you know, a trium, is that how you pronounce it? But I found that quite intriguing, and I particularly found it intriguing because a few weeks later there was an article written in the Sunday Times magazine where somebody had had almost an identical experience in the same location. And we know that Arnold Toynbee had a similar experience as well in Greece, where he found himself going back into the past. And it seems that the past could be, so it could be time slips, yeah, it could be the, an overlapping of different times, and that's a possibility. In terms of crop circles, I'm, I'm very much a sceptic on that, and I'm sceptic because I've done a series of uh, talks in that area for crop circle groups, and I know for a fact from the people who live in that area and the hoteliers in that area that are groups of people that come over and actually do the crop circles, and I was told that quite categorically. Now, who knows whether that really is the truth, I don't know, but I find it very strange that aliens will travel halfway across the universe to actually sort of flatten some grass and put some geometric symbols on there. And the way in which the geometric symbols have become more complex as time has gone on. From originally, you know, the original mowing devil that they actually had in 17th century England, they've now come into these incredibly complex things. Now, it could be that you wouldn't have sufficient time to do them, but I still have to question motivation in terms of that. In terms of Rendlesham, Rendlesham has always intrigued me. There's elements of Rendlesham I don't fully understand. And funnily enough, I'll be doing an event in California um, next May where I'll be talking with two of the guys that were actually involved at Rendlesham as well. So it's going to be very intriguing to do that. So my the, the general general answer is, isn't it, it was um, the lighthouse um, uh, at off, off the coast and they could see it through there. Um, but that doesn't explain how they seemingly thought they'd seen the device much closer. And one of the gentlemen touched the touched machine it. and there were symbols on it. So he claimed, yeah, yeah. that's the, the issue. There's been a lot of questions about the veracity of a lot of them and I, I don't know the case in depth <laughs> enough, but I know friends who have researched it. I, I really am not sure about Roswell. We all know the, the Ray Santilli video that was brought out, which was shown to be a fake, rather eroded that slightly, I think. But it doesn't mean that I don't, I'm not interested in it because ufology has been an interest of mine since I was a child. So I've followed a lot of these cases through the years, although it's not been in my writing until this book, but it is an area that I'm quite interested in. I do indeed. And I think just to, uh, in terms of just an explanation, the Julian James bicameral mind was the idea that um, up until a certain point in time, our brains were not, were, were singular rather than bicameral. There wasn't two sections to the brain and he uses analysis because there is no concept of self when you read the Iliad and books like that. It's always the voice of the gods that are actually telling people to do things. And that was because we were hearing our own <coughs> inner dialogue and interpreting it as being the voice of the gods. But it does seem to me that ancient civilizations seem to have had something we don't necessarily understand yet in terms of form of communication and understanding of their natural environment. I've, in previous talks, I've always used the analogy of if somebody in Victorian times dug up a, a CD-ROM, they would have no idea, they would just think it was a mirror or something that reflected things. And I sometimes wonder that things that we discover and ancient artefacts that we discover that we misinterpret because what we do is we impose our own values, our own interpretations, our own culture onto that and say, oh, it's self-evidently what it is. The Antikythera device is one example, for instance, that was discovered in ancient Greece. We're not quite sure what that was about or what it was for, but it obviously is an incredibly complex mechanism.
clearly I think our history goes back far further than we understand. I mean, water damage on the side of the Sphinx, for instance, gives her examples, the Robert Shock ideas. So clearly there is something here. And I know that our groups were very, very interested in getting to get to these, these, these strange ideas. I mean, for instance, we did an event um, last, last April uh, at the Dracolo Caves in, um, in Staffordshire where we tried to recreate the whole myth of Plato's Cave. And we're planning to recreate this again in the future because we believe this gives people the opportunity to actually go into a cave-like environment in the darkness to actually start to appreciate and to tune into your own something else. Now, I argue in the book that there is so much evidence of people that seem to go into caves. Caves seem to be the standard thing. I mean, there are, there are tribes in Latin America, and what they do is the children are put in darkness for the first six or seven years of their life. And I believe this is to generate melatonin. It's to make melatonin be generated more effectively within the brain because I argue, and I've argued in previous books, that melatonin in the brain can be synthesized from melatonin into what we call metatonin, which is endogenous dimethyltryptamine. And the argument is that we can generate our own hallucinogenic states. And as Rick Strassman has said, one of the major writers on the subject of dimethyltryptamine, he has argued that dimethyltryptamine is in fact our reality regulator. That the reason we create this external world is because the dimethyltryptamine within our brains is actually creating this external world in one way or another. Which then comes right back again to the point I was making before about the researchers at Imperial College. Because here we have people who are going out of body experiences into alternate realities, experiencing entities in those circumstances and coming back and bringing back the information from those entities. To me, this is evidence that there is something very, very peculiar going on in terms of the human brain. Are there books on this? Hmm? On Are this? Are there books on this? Oh, oh, yes, yes. I mean, my own book, uh, uh, Opening the Doors of Perception, deals with this. But there are also people in the room who are involved in this research, because, you know, I'm not going to point people out, but there are people involved in the room who are involved in this. And it's really intriguing stuff. And I think what it's doing is it's changing the paradigm. We're at the point now where suddenly these things are breaking through. They're breaking through into the zeitgeist. People are writing about them. People are making movies about them. It's time that we started to realize that the label theory of science does not work anymore. We have to understand exactly what we mean when we say somebody is hallucinating. We have to understand completely when somebody goes into a lucid dream state, sees somebody in that lucid dream state, sees that person in consensual reality, and they both share the same experience, and they share it with each other. The only reason we believe this reality is consistent is because it's consensual. In other words, I turn around to you and I say, that book is black and it's called Black Mirror. You all agree. That's consensual. But what if a circumstance when you're in an out-of-body state, you meet somebody else and you both see the same thing and then you come back into this reality and you agree that you saw the same thing? That means it's just as real as this is. I call it electromagnetic chauvinism. And I'll make one final point about electromagnetic chauvinism and an analogy, which I put in one of my books. The Mississippi River starts in a very small place in Minnesota. It then goes all the way through the centre of the United States till it comes out in the Gulf of Mexico, 3,000 miles or whatever. If that was equivalent to the electromagnetic spectrum from radio waves to gamma rays, the world we think is real is the visual world of natural light, of light. The whole world we believe is real is one and a half inches, eight miles south of Hannibal, Missouri. Thank you. Yeah.